It's the only currency in which some organizations accept donations, and in a six-month period, its value skyrocketed by 100 times. University of Wyoming economist Robert Godby is here to help explain the Bitcoin phenomena. Rob, what is a Bitcoin? What is a Bitcoin? It's complicated. Uh, yeah, I know. That's a huge <laughs> it's question. A, it's a, it is, it's potentially a currency, a mechanism of payment, or possibly a commodity, a virtual commodity, so living on computers. So it, could be, it, it is all of those three things together potentially, although whether it's a currency or a money or not depends on whether people will take it. If you think of the U.S. dollar, it started originally as something that was transferable. Or you could take it to a Federal Reserve Bank and exchange it for a certain amount of gold. So the value was pretty much determined by what the gold was worth that you could exchange it for, as a minimum. And people accepted it because they assumed everybody else would. The Bitcoins don't have that yet. Not everybody ha will accept Bitcoins. And furthermore, since they're not backed by anything in particular, you can't take um, a Bitcoin, melt it down, and make a ring. They're not regulated. There's no central bank. So what's, you know, if, you, if I accept a Bitcoin from you, it could be worth nothing tomorrow or maybe next week or next year. They've got something to do with earning money online with your computer, right? Um, yes, but only if you have a really good computer nowadays or a whole bunch of really good computers. This is called mining, and you right. have to download the right software and... Yes, so in order to explain mining, you have to go back a couple steps. So in order to get a Bitcoin, you can get it two ways. You could buy one, so you could go to an exchange and buy Bitcoins for dollars or euros or yen. Um, but then the second way to do it is to mine them. So if you were to think, you know, how do I want to buy gold. I could buy gold or I could mine gold. So you can mine bitcoins. Except when you mine bitcoins, instead of physically finding them, you actually solve a very difficult computer problem. And that computer problem is solved approximately once every 10 minutes. And the computer that solves it actually earns right now approximately 25 bitcoins. Um, the problem is very difficult. It's, it's, it's much like trying to break a code. And so you have to, basically, there is no formula to do it. So you basically just have to have a computer try a lot of different possibilities and randomly and eventually it finds the right answer or somebody finds the right answer and the Bitcoins are found. So this problem, is it of value to somebody like the NSA or a mathematician <laughs> or a researcher? No. It's only a value to the Bitcoin community. So this is where it gets a little complicated. Every transaction, so maybe we should go back a step and say, what is a Bitcoin? So a Bitcoin doesn't exist, but it, it's, it's a, a virtual um, object, I guess you could call it. So it's defined by ones and zeros. It's just a digital code. And that digital code lives in what we call the wallet the Bitcoin wallet, which is a computer file. So you can imagine a computer file like a Word document with, and you open it up and it just had a list of numbers. Those would be your Bitcoins. Um, the file has a number, and then there's a third part to it. There's a program. So you have a program on your computer that can open the file that can see how many Bitcoins it has. Now, if I wanna buy something from you and pay you with a Bitcoin, my computer talks to your computer and says, I'm going to transfer my whatever number of Bitcoins from my wallet to your wallet. Now, somewhere in the world, we have to figure out who owns which Bitcoin. Otherwise, that number might get used. I could use the same number again and go somewhere else and use it twice. So we don't want that to happen. So we want to make sure that it's been recorded that I used it once, I gave it to you, now it's your Bitcoin. So that transaction has to be recorded, and that's the problem. Basically, that transaction is converted to a number, which is added to a bigger number, and then they basically solve a mathematical problem based on this bigger number, and when the problem is solved, that's added the transaction to the ledger and it's recorded. So, so Bitcoin transactions sometimes take 10 to 20 minutes to clear, because on average, this problem gets solved every 10 minutes. This is how you could invest illegally gained assets. Right, right. And that's really where some people, a lot of people think that 
Bitcoins really took off. This is really the first virtual currency that you can't trace. So the benefit of a dollar bill is nobody knows where it's been last. I give it to you, you give it to the store. Nobody can trace that dollar bill back. But if you were to use a credit card, we can trace all the transactions that you've been involved in. So you'd, this is one of the reasons why in Colorado right now, you can't buy now legal marijuana with a credit card or use a bank account because the federal laws regarding money laundering are such that banks and credit cards can't be engaged in anything to do with what's still a federally illegal substance. So everything is in cash. Bitcoins, you can't trace where they're from. There's no record. The record is, the most you can trace it back to is a wallet, but nobody knows who owns the wallet. So if you take any sort of, any sort of precaution to make sure you're, you're not associated with that wallet, it can't be traced back to you. So this is a very good way of conducting illegal transactions where the transaction can't be traced back to you. That's why most illegal transactions occurred with cash. So this is why organizations like Anonymous are involved with this, this type of contribution or donation? Um, well, not really. I mean, Anonymous, yeah, they like Bitcoins, but I think that's kind of their tech savvy kind of people. The other big thing behind Bitcoins is really you have these techno libertarians. Uh, Bitcoins take the role of government out of money. They also take the role of banks out of money. It is really peer to peer. There is no need ever to use a bank. It's just your computer talking to my computer. Never clears a bank, never goes through that. So in some ways, this could be their eventual major benefit is you could use your smartphone as your wallet. It's an electronic currency. You could be in the middle of Africa. As long as you have cell phone service, you could conduct a transaction with anybody in the world. You wouldn't have to exchange your currency. You wouldn't have to worry about whether you're using Zimbabwe dollars, which maybe are worthless and nobody will take. So in some ways, this is potentially a, of great benefit. But right now, nobody's really sure what the value of the Bitcoins are worth. So nobody wants to take that risk. Some people don't want to take the risk of accepting them. But do you think this or something like this is the currency of the future? It could be. I mean, Milton Friedman in 1999 talked about how you know, what the world is really missing is this virtual currency. And this is probably the first currency like that. And because it's the first one, this may be why there's this bubble surrounding it. Um, they're worth so much today and nobody really knows why and it looks like it's just people want to jump on to this the next big thing. At the start of 2013 they were worth $13 per Bitcoin. Uh, by December they were worth $1,200. Right as we came to this interview it was worth $900. This morning it was worth $966. Rob Godby, thanks for joining us. You're welcome.